welcome to another episode of Informed Investor. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about various asset classes and how to go about investing in them. Today's conversation is a little bit different in the sense that it does talk about equity markets, but what we're trying to do is simplify some of the, ga- the jargon that you often hear thrown at you. For example, maybe a lot of people who track the equity market don't understand what is being said when people talk about the MENA region or EMs versus DMs or indeed a lot of the data as well. So that's going to be the focal point of this conversation, just demystifying the global jargon and more importantly making the defining line between what actually impacts our market and what may not. Two gentlemen join in for that conversation, Mark Matthews of Macquarie Capital and Shane Oliver of AMP Capital. Gentlemen, thanks both of you for joining in. So we're going to move step by step. We'll start off with terms, then we'll move to data, trends, history, all of that. Mark, let me start with you on the two crucial terms that uh, we hear very often, EMs and DMs. What kind of universe do both these terms straddle and why is it important for someone who's investing in the Indian market to understand what an EM is and what a DM is? Well, uh, both of them are uh, are indices that have about anywhere from uh, 25 to 35 countries in them and they are indices that are managed by several different companies so I'm sure these names are familiar to your viewers. Um, S&P, Dow Jones, um, FTSE, but the biggest one is MSCI because MSCI was the first company to really create a global index um, over 40 years ago and then they created various sub-global indices including emerging and developed markets and uh, very simply the difference between emerging and developed is um, is one of maturity in both income uh, developed markets, uh, one prerequisite is that they should have high incomes per capita and also in terms of the maturity of the market itself so uh, the foreign exchange uh, market should be open, uh, short selling should be allowed, uh, minority shareholders rights uh, should be uh, enforced and protected in developed markets and emerging markets um, it's not to say that um, some emerging markets don't possess those attributes, of course some do, but um, a lot of countries do end up in emerging markets because uh, short selling is not permitted or the foreign exchange uh, market is not open or fully convertible. Um, and, but really the, the general rule of thumb for an emerging market should be that it's a high growth, uh, low income economy. In other words, it's a polite term for third world. And in fact, uh, uh, less developed country was the term that was more popular uh, until around the 1980s and then that was seen as being a little bit politically incorrect so emerging markets was turned by a World Bank economist named Antoine Van Ante- uh, Agtemel. And India would fall under that category you would say? Uh, India is an emerging market mark? Yeah, in all four of the uh, indices uh, so I said you know there's the S&P, FTSE, Dow Jones, but the big one for most uh, institutional fund managers is MSCI, then in all four of those, uh, India is, is represented. There is a, a sub-representation then within the emerging market region which is called the BRIC universe. What countries uh, does that involve and, and why was this, uh, this, this bracket made of just the BRIC universe within the EM context? Well, that was invented by one individual uh, named Jim O'Neill, who was and is the economist at uh, Goldman Sachs. And I think it was 10 years ago, actually. It was in 2001. He wrote a report where he created this acronym. And and, um, sometimes acronyms uh, stick and sometimes they don't. But fortunately for him, that one uh, really stuck. So it stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China. And um, it's uh, curiously, it's it's not a... uh, uh, an acronym that that has really developed into a uh, a full asset class of itself in terms of fund management. There are a few brick funds, but there it never really took off as much as emerging markets did. But what's interesting is politically, um, there seems to be an evolution of this concept. Aside from the technical qualifications between these markets, Mark, are there other ballpark generalizations that people tend to make? For example, uh, the, the opinion is or the observation is that emerging markets tend to be more volatile, more high beta than a developed market. Can those assumptions also be drawn when you're looking at the two clusters? Yeah, generally speaking, um, they are. And why is that? Well, um, I think one very simple reason is because they are 
uh, less developed country, countries. Therefore, they have uh, their middle class as a percentage of the total population is smaller, and therefore um, the amount of uh, you know domestic uh, domestic individuals investing in the uh, stock market uh, is lower uh, in percentage terms than it is in developed markets um, because there isn't as much of a middle class yet. And so in the absence of a large domestic uh, investor base, or at least I should say uh, a fairly sophisticated one, um, there are big domestic investor bases obviously in, in places like China and India, but they tend not to be very sophisticated. They tend to be momentum uh, followers and uh, speculative as opposed to investing in stocks for the long term. Anyway, what I wanted to say is in the absence of that, um, foreign institutional investors assume a much greater uh, directional influence on the market and and that's uh, India would be probably the best example I think in in the uh, in the emerging market space Shin, so we've talked about emerging markets, developed markets, the BRIC universe, but the one which has suddenly become top of mind is the MENA region. What region of the world uh, does that really capture and why has it become so important, especially when we're talking about crude oil and the implications on the equity market? Well, the MENA region is essentially the Middle East and North Africa, so it's, it's countries like Libya, Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia, um, that part of North Africa, and of course the Middle East, which includes Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Um, obviously, that part of the world has always been very important because it's a key supplier of global oil, but in recent uh, months it's hit the headlines because several countries in that region have seen political unrest, starting in Tunisia, um, which then led to problems in Egypt, and then of course more recently in Libya. And although Tunisia and uh, Egypt aren't that significant in terms of world oil supply, um, Libya certainly is. And Libya has broken out in a civil war, which has affected the supply of world oil, and that, of course, has pushed up oil prices. There's also been tensions in some of the Gulf states and, to a lesser degree, in Saudi Arabia. So, as a consequence, investment markets have been looking at that part of the world recently um, as a gauge to how far oil prices might rise and whether that, in turn, might um, adversely impact global economic growth. Okay, let's take a short break on that note. What we've only done right now is laid out the basics for you, what a lot of these terms mean. When we come back from a break, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the data. It's not enough to know your EM from your DM. You need to know what piece of data from which region is something that is of importance to you as an equity investor. Be back with that.